you're listening to the uh, to us through the GoToWebinar platform and hearing the audio by voice over IP through your computers. The audio is also available on a phone line and the dial-in information is um, available on your screen. We're also live captioning this webinar and there's a link in the chat window uh, to give you information about how to connect to the captioning. We're going to be accepting questions from the audience during today's discussion. We look forward to getting a lot of input from you folks um, and a back and forth dialogue. You'll be submitting those in the chat box on the right side of your screen via email to info at peteworks.org or via Twitter using hashtag PeteWorks. So with that out of the way, I want to get us into the subject at hand. We know that accessible ICT is crucial to the hiring, employment, and career advancement of people with disabilities. It's just common sense. When someone can't use the tools they need to do their job, they can't perform to the fullest potential. All of us can play a role in solving this workplace accessibility puzzle. We see it as a relationship among three types of stakeholders. Technology providers who need to make their ICT products accessible. Employers who need to focus on procuring and implementing those accessible workplace technologies. And people with disabilities as employees and as applicants who should know what tools will work for them in the workplace. So it's that trio of stakeholders that we're aiming to serve via PEAT which is a multifaceted initiative working to advance the employment, retention, and career advancement of people with disabilities through the development, adoption, and promotion of accessible technology. PEAT is funded by the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy through a grant to RESNA. PEAT is the only entity of its kind that brings together employers, technology developers, accessibility thought leaders, disability advocates, government policymakers and people with disabilities to focus on accessible technology and employment. We've organized PEAT into three action units. First is the PEAT Policy Think Tank. That's our partnership's thought leadership arm. It brings together relevant partners to identify trends, formulate recommendations, and collaborate on accessible workplace technology issues. For example, right now we're exploring the accessibility of online job applications. Another action unit is the PEAT Network, a community that will exchange information and success stories, providing a sounding board for the voices of key stakeholders, some of whom are on this panel and some of whom I'm sure are in our audience. Several organizations have already joined our network. Organizations like Oracle, Ernst & Young, AT&T, Canon, DQ Systems, CTIA, and IBM. We hope you'll consider joining as well. And finally, there is PeteWorks.org, an online resource center that will house Pete's education and outreach activities. This soon-to-launch portal will feature educational articles, guest blog posts, and a gateway to opportunities to collaborate and contribute to the dialogue around accessible technology in the workplace. Also featured is TechCheck, an interactive tool to help employers assess their technology accessibility practices and find tools to help them develop those practices further. You can visit PeteWorks.org now to sign up for email updates about our launch and to learn more about getting involved. You can also follow PeteWorks on Facebook and Twitter. So let me take a minute to talk about what I'm hoping to hear from today's panel because I'm just as excited to be learning from these folks as you are. One of the ways that we structure the topic of accessible technology from the perspective of companies or other entities that make or develop or design technology is what are the business advantages? How is accessible technology providing value to your company? How is it being used strategically to reach business objectives? But we recognize that there's a, a second issue, laws and, tech and regulations, that also have to be addressed. And I'm very curious about how the folks on the panel today are meshing those two, which some think of as a conflict. You know, I'm over here making money, I'm over there obeying the law. How can we bring those together in an efficient 
accessibility program and what are you doing along those lines. And that brings us to the point that Pete is really organized around, which is helping uh, companies, whether they're technology providers or employers that use technology in the workplace or employees, in this case we're talking about technology providers, how are you organizing your accessibility work? For instance, when we talk about technical standards, there's one way of looking at the standards as a kind of dead document lying on a page somewhere or a website somewhere, but the real value comes in translating them into your context of work. So your designers and developers who know your product so well, what is it about those technical standards that applies to those products and what's something that maybe doesn't apply? And how do you, um, uh, how do you make that translation happen and work uh, in your development process? Staff training we know is a key issue. One of the things we hear constantly from the ICT uh, community is that there aren't enough trained people, there aren't enough experts out there, there's not enough certainty, there's not enough experience. So what are you doing both near term in terms of developing your own staffs right here right now and what are you thinking about doing long term in terms of developing your training programs and consortia or other cooperative efforts for making accessibility a real profession. And this brings me to the final point, um, for me anyway, one of my personal interests is organizational development. How are you structuring what looks at one level as a purely technical job of making sure that accessibility features are built into products? How are you structuring that organizationally so that it responds to legal and regulatory needs, to marketing needs, to the needs of executives and strategy, to the needs of technology procurement? Uh, to staffing and training needs, how do you bring it all together to make an efficient and effective accessibility initiative? So that's what I'm looking forward to hearing today and continuing on in dialogue with the folks on the panel and the folks in the audience. With that, I'm going to hand it over to our moderator, Richard Crespin, to introduce himself and each panelist, and we'll hear some remarks from each of them, then we'll open it up to Q&A. Richard? Thank you so much, Jim. That was a great way of teeing up our conversation today. We really appreciate it. I know we have a ton that we want to get into today, so I want to dive right in here. As Jim said, I am Richard Crispin, and I am the CEO of Collaborate Up. We specialize in accelerating collaboration on important issues like this one, and that's why I'm so honored to be here serving as your moderator today. Uh, as moderator, basically, I'll be playing traffic cop. That's really my job, is to make sure that our panelists get to share their great insights with you. But more than that, I'm here to make sure that you get your questions answered and your issues addressed. This is your webinar. Uh, and, and as Jim touched on, you have a number of different ways that we can take your input. We want it by email. We, we want it by Twitter. We want it to the chat function within uh, GoToWebinar here. So if you, if you can and you have questions as we go through here, please do send them by email to info at peteworks.org, by Twitter using the hashtag peteworks, or using the chat window, and we'll get to those as quickly as we can. Uh, and right from the beginning, to make sure that we get your virtual voice in this conversation, I want to start off with a polling question. So if we could please bring up our first polling question, uh, just so we can get a sense of who is here uh, on our webinar today. Uh, we'd love to know. Are you a manager, senior manager, director of IT? Are you in information security? Are you a developer or a programmer, an accessibility specialist, or other? Um, that's really going to help us make sure that we tailor our conversation today for your needs. And as soon as those uh, responses come in here, if we can pl put up those results. Uh, and while we're waiting for those, I'm going to go ahead and tee up our first panelist, uh, who is Katie Cunningham. Uh, a developer with the Cox Media Group and the author of a great book, uh, Accessibility Handbook, Making 508 Compliant Websites. Uh, but before we turn it over to uh, Katie, can we see the results of that poll? Perhaps we are still waiting on a few people to answer the poll. Yes, people are still, people are still working the on the poll. Um, and I think okay, we're okay. Well, while we're waiting, um, Katie, why don't we go ahead and uh, 
Well, actually, we'll, 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 we'll wait just another second here for, for, the, uh, for the answers to roll in here. Um, as I mentioned, we are going to hear from a number of folks uh, on, on uh, today's panel. Um, but go ahead, Katie, uh, take it away. Hi. Um, my name is Katie Cunningham. I am a Python developer, and I work at Cox Media Group. And I'm also the author of the Accessibility Handbook um, from O'Reilly Media. Next slide. I wanted to talk a little bit about what is accessibility, because sometimes people don't quite understand what accessibility is. Um, accessibility is basically making sure that all the data and all the functions for an application, no matter how somebody accesses it, is accessible to all your users, no matter how they are getting, um, no matter how they're accessing it. Uh, next slide. Accessibility is actually usability, which is what I think a lot of people get confused about. They think of accessibility as a checklist. You break out a checklist and you check off all the team, you tick off all the items, and ta-da, you're done. Your site is totally accessible. But accessibility is actually usability for a group of users who have additional needs. So they want good websites, they want good, clean applications, and they have a few additional needs. Next slide. So I wanted to go over pretty briefly uh, just who it covers, because many people, when they talk to me, they said, oh, well, it's all about blind people, right? And that's all I have to worry about is screen readers. There are actually five groups that I kind of break everybody out into. Next slide. And these are the five groups. Um, the blind is anybody who uses a screen reader to access an application. And that includes browsers and web pages and stuff like that. The visually impaired are people who um, cannot have their vision. Um, they cannot have their vision um, corrected to like 2080, 2100. So we're not talking people with glasses who can put on glasses and see perfectly. We're talking people for whom perfect vision is a pipe dream. They're never going to get there. This also includes people who are colorblind, because often you use color to indicate things on your website. For example, you might use it to indicate on a chart or an infogram, like, you know, how intense of an effect we had, how many things we had, compare this to this. If you're colorblind, this can be problematic. There's also the hearing impaired, which not only includes people in the deaf community, it also includes people who, um, it also includes people who use hearing aids. So this impacts anybody who uses your website if your website has videos or audio clues. The physically impaired um, might have issues controlling motion, they might have very slow motion, or they might be only able to use their computer for a limited amount of time. This includes people with, with conditions like arthritis. The cognitively impaired is a group um, that, you know, it might be intellectual disabilities, but it might also be um, information processing disabilities, like dyslexia um, or ADD or ADHD. Next slide. So just to give you some numbers, these numbers are all um, U.S. And because a lot of people come to me and they say, well, there's not, that many there's not that many disabled people, so why do I have to worry? Well, there's 7.9 million people in the U.S. who have visual disabilities of some kind. 10% um, of men, all men are colorblind. There are 50 million people with arthritis. In the U.S., there's 1 million people who are completely deaf and 36 million who are in some way hearing impaired. And 40 million people in the US have dyslexia. Now, if you look around and you say, but I don't see that many disabled people, um, that's because 90% of all disabilities are invisible. You cannot tell somebody has a disability just by looking at them. Next slide. So how does accessibility work? Um, one of the ways that accessibility works is you have to understand the tools that the person is using. Um, you have to think about, sorry, hold on a sec. Um, you have to think about how they're accessing their computer and how they're accessing information. For example, people with physical, physical disabilities might be bound to only using a mouse and an on-screen keyboard. There are others that can't use a mouse. They can only use their keyboard to get around. So can you access all the information 
in all of the functionality of your application by just using the mouse or just using uh, your keyboard. They might use a screen reader, like a separate application, that reads out websites and metadata to them. Are you properly, are you making sure that that metadata exists? Because if it doesn't exist, they can't get to it, and your site is not accessible. Um, many times, the way it works best is that if you think about it from the beginning, uh, I'm somebody who often gets pulled in at the end, that they drag me in, they say, OK, our site is done, please make it accessible. And my response is usually, I hope you have deep pockets. Because at that point, I, I'm tearing apart things, and I'm saying we have to redo these things completely. If you talk to somebody who is an expert in accessibility at the beginning, we can guide it, and it's, oh, and it's really inexpensive. Um, so next slide. So why do it? Um, one of the first reasons is government regulation. Most, most um, nations have some version of the 508 law, which is the accessibility law in the US. And when I say most, I really mean most. They, almost all of them have it, and many of them are even stricter than our, um, than our 508 laws. There's also the ADA laws. Now, if you're not doing a website that has any interaction with the government, you might say, well, then I don't have to do it. However, several websites have been taken to court, um, and they were not tried under the 508 regulation. They were tried under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And the logic was, if you have a public site that you have to make accessible for you because it is a public, you know, public area, you have to make it accessible for wheelchairs and the blind and such, your website needs to mirror that. Now, all of those cases, uh, they, were, um, they were settled. So there's, no, there's no case law. However, people are beginning to get much more, they're putting more pressure on extending these laws. And there are other countries that are extending these laws. Also, there's a saying, rising, a rising tide lifts all boats. An accessible site is a better site for everyone. Um, I know that I prefer it if I have the option to see captions on videos, because I don't always have headphones. Or I'm not in a place where I can plug my headphones in and watch the video. I prefer it if I can just read along. It also helps me search for information on your video-heavy site, because now I, you can actually index all of those, you know, everything that's said in the video. And I can search for that. Um, people who have dyslexia tend to dislike things like all caps and lots of motion and certain color combinations that are annoying. And it's like, well, most of us hate that too. You know, the difference is, is that what makes for an unpleasant experience for us makes us that unusable for them. But wouldn't you like a better experience? And almost all these groups, if you improve the site for them, you will improve it for everyone. Now, I say baby boomers here um, because baby boomers are they're a large group in the US. And they are beginning to discover that even if they're able-bodied now, they're slowly fitting into those other groups. Their vision is going. Their hearing is going. Um, many of them are discovering that they have arthritis and can't use the computer as long. Um, they may not be able to. Their, their dexterity has gone down. Some people, with baby, like some of the baby boomers, have discovered, you know, they have early onset dementia or Alzheimer's. It's not so bad that they have to go and live with somebody else, but you know they are discovering that everyday tasks like paying their bills are becoming more difficult. So you know the baby boomers aren't special; they're just a very large group, and they're just getting older. And that brings us to the last point: almost all of us will need accessibility at one point. Um, we will either get older, we could get injured. I had a um, traumatic hand injury on my dominant hand. And it threw me for a loop um, because there was no accessibility services at my college and no advocates. I had to drop out because nobody could understand what it was like to lose your dominant hand and not be able to take notes. Um, so you know you're going to get older, you're going to get injured, or it'll happen to someone you love. Next slide. Is that it, Katie? Did you have anything else? No, that's all I have. Okay, awesome. Um, let's go back to that polling question. 
if we could see here. So it looks like, whoa, hello, 64% of you are from other, from a different category than we had up here. That's really interesting. We'd love to hear from you about what, what your title is. So if you want to hashtag us in tw Twitter using hashtag PeteWorks, if you want to send us a question, we'd love to know where you are coming from. But then the next biggest category there was accessibility specialists. So very interesting set of uh, folks on today's webinar. Um, why don't we bring up our second polling question, if we could, please? Uh, our next question is going to be, um, do you have accessible technology, uh, do you have an accessible technology initiative in your organization? This one's a pretty simple one, a yes or a no. And while we're waiting for folks uh, to respond to that one, you guys can uh, just put that polling those polling answers up as soon as they're ready. Uh, Katie, I want to come back to you for a second. Uh, so it seems to me that uh, if I'm hearing you correctly in terms of the business case, if you will, for doing this, a lot of it comes down to, well, there's the compliance issue, there's the opportunity to reach more customers and more users through a rising tide mentality. We've also got this silver tidal wave of the baby boomers, but it also just kind of comes down to that golden rule of treat others like you want to be treated. Uh, is that correct? Um, that is one of the things I try to emphasize with other people. You also never know when somebody internal to your organization will be hired and they will have a disability. Mm -hmm. um, it might happen while they're on the job or they might just be the best applicant. I worked with an excellent system administrator who um, he was blind, completely blind. And this was something that the organization um, had to think about after they hired him. And it would have been more helpful had they already had in place, you know, that kind of way of thinking um, about way of thinking about people who have disabilities, and they just had never thought about it before. And but what was interesting is when they brought him on, it really opened up their eyes to things mm. they needed to do, and they actually have a better accessibility effort now because they realized how difficult it was to do certain things. Mm -hmm. It also seems like the other a very fundamental point I think you made right at the top here is that accessibility is usability and that uh, if you think of it in that framework, if you think of this just really as another lens of usability, that certainly makes the case for why to, why to address it earlier. And I think you really made an economic argument there as well that, uh, boy, you better, if you, if you address it from the beginning and it, you incorporate it fundamentally into the design, you're going to save yourselves a lot of money. Absolutely. Um, I am much cheaper if you hire me at the beginning. <laughs> well, oftentimes that's the case. If we, if we know what we're doing from the beginning, uh, we can save ourselves a lot of money and effort. Well, thanks, Katie. We're going to come back to uh, a larger group discussion in a minute. But while uh, I want to move on here to our next panelist, Dennis Amorosano, who is the Vice President and General Manager uh, in the Marketing Unit there at Canon USA. If we can go ahead and bring up um, uh, Dennis's slides. Uh, as I said, Dennis is the VP and General Manager for the Marketing Division of the Business Imaging Solutions Group at Canon USA. Uh, Dennis, over to you. Thank you, Richard, and uh, it's a pleasure for, uh, for us to be here uh, from, from Canon and uh, certainly uh, very happy to participate in uh, today's WebEx. Um, you know, this is an area that's uh, been a major focus for us as an organization for quite some time, and not, not only in terms of technology development, but also in terms of uh, the, the activities we drive in, 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 in regards to employment of uh, folks within the PWD community. Um, just to kind of give you some background on Canon and, and why this is so important to us, if we could go to my next slide. Um, you, you'll find that uh, you know, Canon as an organization uh, has a corporate philosophy that we call Kiyose. And Kiyose uh, is defined as living and working for the common good. Uh, and th again, this really drives us in, in terms of uh, the, the way in which um, we, we develop products and technology, uh, as well as uh, the ways in which uh, we operate uh, within the communities um, where we have presence around the world. Uh, and, and certainly it's true in terms of how our technology is utilized by, by folks who are able-bodied as well as uh, folks who have various types of disabilities. Uh, we as a company want to ensure that uh, the user experience associated with our products and technologies is, is no different, uh, you know, regardless of whether or not an individual may happen to possess uh, certain physical challenges in, in terms of uh, the, their use of the technology itself. And, uh, we, we found that uh, by focusing in, in, in this area that um, obviously it's provided us as an organization with uh, an opportunity to build technology that, that in many ways becomes more usable by all users uh, in the marketplace who are interfacing with, with our products. And certainly 
it's also allowed us, I think, in many ways to, uh, to, to act as, as a leader in terms of uh, building technology and programs, uh, for example, that can support uh, the, the PWD community. And you know, I think uh, you know, Katie framed uh, the, the topic so well. Um, you know, in, in terms of, of accessibility, it's a much broader issue than just folks uh, who may today have uh, physical abilities or be, have challenges there. Um, you know, this is a, an issue that affects uh, the workforce in general, particularly as the workforce ages. So um, one of the points that Katie had, had re referenced, um, you know, is, is so true. Uh, as all of us get older, uh, it's very likely at some point in, in our lifetimes uh, we're, we're going to face different types of physical challenges in terms of interfacing with technology. And so this becomes critically important. Uh, not, not only, again, in, in terms of supporting uh, the, the PWD community, but uh, certainly in terms of supporting folks who may, at, at this point in time, uh, you know, have no challenges, quite frankly, in terms of accessing technology. Can we go to my next slide, please? Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, Canon is an organization that we have a long history here. Um, this is uh, not something that we've just started to focus on recently, uh, and I think you'll find that uh, again, Canon as, as an organization, because we were founded by a medical doctor and we, we've always had a core focus around health and health-related issues, um, we, we've, uh, you know, over time uh, focused on how can we build and, and develop technology that can be utilized by uh, people in, in, in the world that will really improve their, their overall quality of life. And, and uh, we have a couple of examples here. Um, that that, uh, that you can see, one of which is uh, the Canon Communicator as well as uh, the, the Canon Opticon, uh, both of which were technologies that were uh, ideally suited to uh, helping uh, you know, personnel who, uh, who had uh, visual uh, impairments uh, and help uh, those uh, types of individuals uh, you know, more easily communicate. Um, uh, as compared to the tools that were available at the time. And, and you know, the, these early efforts, uh, quite frankly, have been followed by a continued history of development and innovation that, that crosses the full Canon product portfolio. Uh, some of those innovations and, and, uh, and, and capabilities uh, I'll, I'll share with you uh, in, in just a few minutes. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, building technology by itself is, is only one part of the equation for us uh, in Canon. Um, we, we also have driven significant programs in terms of employing personnel uh, with various types of disabilities in, in a number of Canon facilities, uh, the most notable of which uh, are, are the efforts that we've driven uh, at our, our factory in Virginia that we call CBI. Uh, where we've had a long-standing program of employing uh, personnel with disabilities in various types of job roles and assignments. Uh, so again, th this has been a, an area of focus for us as a company uh, that, that uh, you know, spanned from, from not only technology development, uh, but also uh, the way in which uh, we, we work to uh, drive gainful employment for uh, you know, persons afflicted with various types of disabilities. Can we go to the next slide, please? So there, there are a number of ways that uh, you know we're, we're addressing um, the, the marketplace and, and approaching uh, accessibility in general. And, and I think uh, you know Katie certainly reviewed a lot of these in her discussion around uh, you know building more accessible websites and so forth. And, and obviously, Canon is focused in those areas as well in connection with a number of our web properties. Uh, but a lot of our effort, uh, you know, starts with uh, the, the various uh, research and development activities uh, that we drive and, and the, the, the money that we invest in those areas. And as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, Canon is trying to build our technology such that we, we can create uh, a, an enjoyable user experience, um, regardless of whether the technology happens to be consumer-oriented in nature or office technology in, in, in nature. And, um, but by developing uh, the technology to try to enhance user experience, again, uh, and, and doing so uh, with the, uh, the PWD community in mind, we're actually able to develop uh, an experience that, that supports not just the needs of, of uh, folks with disabilities, but, but also improve the experience for personnel who don't. So, so the activity and the investment we make here ha has long-reaching uh, implications uh, for, for Canon as a company and ultimately provides us an ability to uh, deliver to our customers a, a much more enhanced user experience uh, as compared to if we had only developed uh, in, in support of uh, the, the general office uh, user community. So, 
You'll also find that the Canon as an organization has major investments that we continue to make in terms of, of human factors design. Uh, and, and this, uh, and in addition to the, the, the testing we do in connection with new technology development, really plays a major role in, in terms of uh, ensuring that the user interface uh, uh, technology that we design uh, and the, the, the access related um, uh, activities around our technology are well thought out. Uh, again, in, in connection with folks who, who are, are fully able-bodied as well as folks uh, who have various types of, uh, of impairment uh, within the PWD community itself. Can we go to the next slide, please? We're, we're also pleased to be a part of uh, a number of associations and, and drive a number of activities in the marketplace. And, and um, you know, these associations and the activities that, that you see referenced here I think are, are great examples of how Canon is taking a continued leadership position in, in this particular space. And quite frankly, they, they also represent opportunities for us as an organization to get a consistent level of feedback from the marketplace that we use to help us ultimately build technology that, that's more directly suited to addressing uh, some of the accessibility challenges that, uh, that are, are, are you know, being faced by users in the marketplace today. Uh, and, and frankly speaking, the kind of input we, we've uh, been able to receive from our relationship uh, and activities with the associations mentioned here uh, are, are things that we're, we're driving directly into our research and development process and in many cases have really spawned uh, some of the very specific technology offerings that, that we bring to market today, uh, many of which, again, are specifically designed to address uh, various types of, uh, of you know, challenges that are faced by, by users uh, in, in general office environments and, of course, users of our consumer technology as well. Uh, in addition, um, as an organization, we're, we're very focused on how can we help um, promote the development of standards uh, in the marketplace. Um, you know, clearly, um, you, you know, Katie mentioned the, the, the role of, uh, of regulation and, and, and the law uh, as one driving factor in terms of, of development of technology that, that is, you know, more suited to meeting the needs of, of folks with disabilities. Uh, but, you know, that, that's only one factor. You know, clearly um, the, the more we can do to promote standards in this area and, and encourage other manufacturers like ourselves is to build their own technology capabilities, um, you know, the, the better uh, we, we think um, we, we can then serve, uh, in, again, not just uh, users with various disabilities, but, um, you know, the, the population that uses technology at large. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, we've been very fortunate uh, to, to be recognized for, um, you know, a, a number of the activities that we've driven in the marketplace. And, um, you know, as you can see here, these are just a few of the, the recognitions that, that we've received uh, in, in the market. So, um, you know, again, uh, you know, some of the work we've done in, in terms of folks with various sight impairments uh, have received recognition by the American Foundation for the Blind and, and the like. And uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the work we've done, particularly at our facility at Canada, Virginia, in employing personnel um, with various types of disabilities, I think has, has been a, a model for how other organizations uh, can do the same and, and has garnered us some, some nice recognition um, from uh, the state of uh, Virginia in particular. So um, th these are things we're very proud of within Canon and, and certainly uh, you know, efforts that uh, we, we, we look to continue. Uh, as uh, we, we drive our, our corporate philosophy of Kiyose and, and ultimately embody accessible activities uh, in, in connection with that philosophy. If we can go to our next slide, please. please. So as I mentioned, um, there are a number of uh, different types of uh, technologies that we bring to market. Uh, I thought it would be helpful to share just a few of these here in connection with uh, our, our primary office equipment product line. So, uh, many of the folks on the call today may be familiar with Canon's Image Runner multifunction products, uh, which we find uh, deployed in, in uh, various sized office environments uh, throughout uh, the United States and the world. And um, th this technology uh, ha has really benefited, quite frankly, from a fair amount of development activity in and around uh, accessibility. So um, we, we have a number of capabilities that we offer in connection with our image runner products that, that quite frankly, uh, make these technologies uh, highly easy to use 
uh, again, not only for folks with, with uh, disabilities, but for folks uh, who, who don't. And, um, you know, that being said, um, you know, again, as a company, we're trying to, to foster an environment where uh, users can have a, a highly positive experience in using our technology and uh, can perform their work tasks uh, without, quite frankly, having to understand the complexities of, te of the technology itself and, and uh, our, our accessible design uh, and the various uh, uh, technical capabilities that we offer in, in combination with uh, these products as well as others in the Canon product line uh, certainly, I think, are great examples of uh, you know how we're putting that into practice and uh, the impact that uh, these technologies are having on uh, ensuring that um, the entire workforce uh, within a customer uh, of Canon's is capable of fully leveraging uh, our, our product offerings uh, to fulfill their job requirements. And if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, if you are interested in, in other activities that uh, that um, Canon is driving and involved in uh, in and around uh, the, the accessibility initiatives um, within our organization, you can find a, a great uh, amount of information on various uh, Canon websites, uh, some of which is outlined here. Um, for example, uh, if you are interested in some of the things we're doing from a technology standpoint, uh, we, we have a very comprehensive universal design. A guide uh, an initiative that, that kind of talks about uh, some of the major um, design initiatives that we're driving in connection with the PWD community. Uh, we also obviously are, are focusing on accessibility issues uh, beyond technology itself, uh, which, which you'll be able to find in terms of the accessibility initiatives info you see here. And then finally, of course, a lot of our effort uh, is, is driven through our federal government sales division, which has a significant amount, a significant amount of information in terms of uh, the, the activities we're driving uh, in support of uh, the Section 508 regulations, uh, not, not to mention uh, the, the, the overall accessibility community itself. So, so again, it's our pleasure as an organization to be involved in this area, uh, certainly to, uh, to work with the Partnership on Employment and, and Accessible Technology. Uh, and uh, share with, with all of you on the call some of the things that uh, we think are, are of importance in, in terms of supporting the PWD community and, and, and why those things are, are certainly not only of benefit to the end users of our technology, but, but hopefully can act as an example for other organizations uh, to follow in their own accessibility initiatives. So thank you for that. Let me turn it back to, uh, to Richard. Thanks, Dennis. That was terrific. Um, I'm remiss if I don't uh, return to our last polling question when we asked if uh, you all had a accessible technology initiative in your organization. The vast majority, or well over 80% of you, said that you did. Um, and I want to bring up, before we move on to our last uh, panelist, I do want to bring up one more polling question, uh, if we could please. And, and our third polling question is going to touch on whether or not your company sells to the federal government. Uh, so if you could uh, please answer that question, yes, no, or not applicable. Uh, Dennis, I want to come quickly back to you while we're waiting for those uh, polling answers. Uh, you mentioned the, the, the importance of standards, um, and, and I know Canon belongs to a number of standards setting bodies. Uh, can you maybe touch a little bit on, on how you see standards helping to drive innovation uh, or create opportunity in this area for other manufacturers, including Canon? Sure. Well, well, I mean, standards certainly um, would, would help organizations like ours and other manufacturers that at least develop to a, a base level of, of capability that would be a benefit to uh, end users in the marketplace. So, so from that standpoint, um, you know, having standards emerge around accessibility w without question would, would be of significant value to um, to users in the marketplace who, who do have uh, you know existing disabilities or, or you know who, who may ultimately develop them uh, over their working careers. Uh, so from that perspective, you know we, we're, we're certainly in favor of, uh, favor of seeing some level of standards uh, be, be developed uh, in, in the marketplace, and, and, and whether that happens through regulation or whether that happens through. Um, you know, different uh, groups, uh, you know, agreeing uh, to, to build to those standards uh, certainly would, would be fine. Of course, standards also help us, quite frankly, from a manufacturing standpoint in that, um, you know, it, it, it allows us to, uh, you know, lessen some of the development costs we have associated with, with certain technologies as we, we can build at least to a common denominator across our technology platforms. 
uh, and uh, you know, as opposed to uh, you know, for example, ha having to, to try to react to uh, you know different changes in the marketplace and and, uh, and and a different set of requirements, having a baseline that we can we can develop to uh, certainly provides us with some economies of scale in terms of R and D and development. So for those reasons, certainly uh, we're, we're very much in favor here. Uh, but ultimately, the, the the biggest winner in terms of standards development, quite frankly, is is the PWD community itself. And and today, as as I think we know, uh, there aren't a, a significant level uh, or, or a significant amount of standards that exist in the marketplace around accessibility. So to the extent that that can happen, uh, I, I think uh, the the user community certainly would be the biggest beneficiary. Wonderful. Thanks, Dennis. Um, Look, there we have our, uh, our our poll answer there. Uh, looks like the majority of you uh, selling to the federal government is not applicable. 23% uh, said uh, no, and 13% of you said yes. I do also understand that some folks are having trouble with the poll. Uh, if you would like to respond or participate in our polls, you can respond in the chat window, and we will certainly capture those uh, responses for the record. Uh, feel free to go back and respond to the prior polls or to this one now. Um, in your chat window, and we'll capture those. Uh, now I'd like to turn to our uh, third and final presenter, uh, Lori Ellington. Lori is a manager of state government affairs at CTIA, the Wireless Association. Uh, welcome, Lori. Thank you, Richard. Um, first, let me take this opportunity to just thank Pete for having me and to thank everyone who's participating in the webinar today. Um, over the past few years, CTIA has really ramped up its accessibility outreach efforts, and we're excited to be exploring synergies within the wireless ecosystem and assistive technology in the workplace. Um, next slide, please. For those of you who are not familiar with CTIA, uh, we are a trade association representing all sectors of wireless communications. Um, our membership is made up of companies of all sizes and comprises the wireless ecosystem. For example, our carrier members include the four largest carriers, um, Verizon, Sprint, AT&T, and T-Mobile, and uh, we also have regional carriers. Um, I serve as manager of state government affairs where I manage CTIA's accessibility outreach initiative, and I support Matthew Gerst in our outreach efforts on accessibility. Next slide, please. So the wireless uh, landscape, I, mean, I tend to think of it as this wireless revolution because we all um, know someone with a cell phone and that probably relies on that cell phone and probably have two at this point. Um, so there are a lot of wireless subscriber connections in the U.S., 326 million to be exact. Um, wireless products and services are central communications tools for everyone, um, including individuals with disabilities and seniors. Um, as many of us now use wireless for everything from, from health care to education to transportation to energy, uh, CTIA and our members believe that all consumers should be able to take advantage of innovative wireless products and services. Next slide. So breaking down barriers to accessibility. Um, CTIA recognizes the challenges that many people with disabilities face in everyday life, including employment. But we see many opportunities in wireless for everyone, including people with disabilities. So, so what is wireless accessibility and what does it mean at CTIA? Uh, wireless accessibility means that all consumers can take advantage of the opportunities that wireless offers. And I think this aligns pretty well with Katie's statement earlier um, when she aligned um, accessibility with usability, you know, it's the two being analogous. Uh, we know that people with disabilities share the same inclinations towards cell phone and internet usage as does the general population. But we also know that people with disabilities have unique needs. For example, we know that people with hearing limitations increasingly rely on wireless text-based communications. So uh, many of our carrier members offer text-only or data-only plans for people with hearing limitations who don't use those voice services as much. Um, our member companies, um, both carriers and manufacturers, develop uh, a wide array of products to meet many different needs. Just as it's important to consider the impact of universal design on our physical world, uh, we should also consider the impact of universal design in the online world. And this is a thinking that CTIA and our member companies strive toward. 
Next slide, please. So how does CTIA meet this goal? Uh, following the passage of the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act, the FCC challenged the telecommunication industry to educate consumers about opportunities uh, wireless devices and services offer people with disabilities. Um, CTIA accepted that challenge, and we have led an effort with our member companies to work with consumer advocates to work with the FCC and to work with our member companies to update our accessibility website, which is accesswireless.org. Um, today, Access Wireless has won awards from the FCC, from the Hearing Loss Association of America, and the FCC and many of the advocacy groups that we work with have recognized our efforts and those of our member companies. So that's something that we're, we're pretty proud of. Um, CTIA has also created the Accessibility Outreach Initiative, uh, which I mentioned earlier. And um, the initiative is a resource to assist our member companies in engaging the accessibility community. But more than that, uh, this initiative is an opportunity for our member companies and the accessibility community to build relationships and to learn from one another and to work toward a common goal. We began this initiative in 2011. And in that time, we've held in-person meetings. We've held webinars, um, much like this one, on a variety of policy topics. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So this is a screenshot of the Access Wireless homepage, which I encourage you to visit when you have a moment. Um, our homepage features a video from our new president and CEO, Meredith Atwell Baker, um, and this video really demonstrates that our commitment to this issue comes from the very top. Next slide, please. So key features of accesswireless.org. Um, I won't go through all of these, but some of the key features of Access Wireless include um, the Find a Phone tool to search for accessible wireless handsets. And that Find a Phone tool um, is managed by the Mobile Manufacturer Forum's uh, Global Accessibility Reporting Initiative. Um, another cool feature on Access Wireless is um, our hearing aid compatibility training videos. Um, and we also have links available to our individual member companies' accessibility pages. Um, one recent addition to accesswireless.org is the Smartphone Tips for Seniors, which is a result of one of those accessibility outreach meetings that uh, we have hosted earlier this year with our member companies um, and with representatives from the older adult community. So I would encourage you as you're looking at Access Wireless to check out those um, tip sheets. Next slide. So here at CTIA, we're still learning, you know, when it comes to trends um, in wireless and especially in the workplace. But we know that a number of companies have begun to utilize um, this bring your own device policy in the workplace. For example, IBM did a study which showed that people believe smartphones to be a really critical essential tool for the workplace. Um, smartphones offer consumers the ability to customize their device to meet their own unique needs and interests. That's why um, BYOD is particularly beneficial to employees with disabilities. Uh, companies can take advantage of accessible solutions already in the market simply by encouraging um, employees to find a wireless device that meets their needs. Um, and we tend to think of wireless as being really revolutionary in this respect. Next slide. Accessible features and wireless devices. Um, so as an example of that, um, I'm really excited about a few increasingly standard features for wireless smartphones. And so just to name a few, um, there are built-in screen readers and personal assistance software that's out there, such as Siri, Google Talks, Cortana. These are all really revolutionary for people who value ease of use um, and ease of access uh, with the device. Uh, with all the investment in new wireless technologies, HD voice-enabled devices will offer clearer voice communications for people with um, hearing limitations. And for people with physical and cognitive limitations, wireless devices can be customized for ease of use um, in menus, home screens, and more. Next slide, please. 
So before I close, I wanted to highlight one area in which I believe the wireless industry has been really proactive, and that's in 911 emergency communications. Um, as we increasingly rely only on wireless, um, emergency communications is one of our members' highest priorities. Uh, last year, the four nationwide wireless providers fulfilled voluntary commitments to support tech to 911 in areas where local 911 call centers have asked and are capable of receiving these messages. Um, in the workplace, text to 911 can be helpful for people who can't make a voice call or who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, it's another example of how we are harnessing wireless technology to address accessible needs in ways that we believe will benefit everyone. Last slide. So with that, I will um, conclude my presentation. Uh, my contact information is on the screen. Uh, thank you so much for your attention, and I look forward to the dialogue. Thanks so much, Lori, and thanks to all of our panelists. This has been uh, just a, a, almost a fire hose here of information, so I, I really appreciate it. And I know so do our, uh, our audience participants. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to try to tease apart a couple of different issues. Uh, but as I said at the beginning, I really do want to get the audience involved here. So please do start sending us your questions so that we can begin uh, making sure that we're answering and addressing your issues. I've got a ton of questions, and I can fill up all of our time with those. But much more interesting to you, I think, will be to have your own specific questions answered. So with that, while folks are submitting some of their questions to us, I want to dive right in here. Uh, a couple of things that you know, we've heard a lot about the benefits uh, and the positive results of supporting accessible design. I want to know some of the challenges you guys have experienced. How have you, uh, what, what are the biggest challenges you're seeing out there? How are you overcoming them, both as organizations and as industries? And, Maybe, uh, Lori, I'll flip that one first to you. If you could tell us what are the sort of the challenges you're seeing out there uh, for wireless providers in, in, in and amongst your members. Um, well, I know one of the challenges that we are trying to address is um, making inroads or making connections between wireless providers and the accessibility community and, uh, and manufacturers so that there is this dialogue um, up front in the beginning. I know one of the panelists mentioned that you know, when you're um, building this technology, the manufacturers really need to um, build on the front end rather than on the back end. You know, it's less expensive that way, and the technology tends to work a little better. So I know that that's one of the things uh, that, that we are working on. I think the other challenge is that technology is, you know, an innovation. It's all moving so quickly, and so a lot of times the regulations can't really keep up with all the innovation that's happening. So, you know, that's something that we continue to work with the Federal Communications Commission on, um, and, uh, and that's just for the better for everyone. Terrific. Thanks, Lori. Uh, Katie, what about uh, for you and your, your clients and, 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 uh, and associates? How are you seeing? What were the big challenges you're seeing? Well, a lot of the challenge is re-education. Um, you have to make sure that management understands that, you know, you bring this in at the beginning, you talk about it at the beginning, and that they can't just have managers go to these things and understand what's going on. You have to have the developers and the front-end designer, you know, the front-end developers and the back-end developers and the designers sit down with somebody who understands accessibility and really learn it. It doesn't take that long to, I mean, it's, it's complex to be like an expert in it, but it doesn't take that long to get some really good solid basics down. And most, you know, people are like, well, we'll just we'll do it at the end. And the honest truth is most of the time nobody does it at the end. I might come in and do a report and say this is what you need to do. And it just never mm -hmm. quite gets done. Yeah, so how how do we how do we overcome that barrier? How do we get people to, to get more involved from the beginning, uh, to widen the circle of involvement, to include more managers, developers, back end, front end, and, and everybody in between? I mean, most of it's pretty easy. Bring somebody in the beginning to talk about it when you're first trying to understand the problem, and make it a habit. Like have it be a part of your culture that you ask these questions. Like you know, well. Does that image need alt text, and that people can give intelligent answers as to why it does or does not 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 need alt text, and what kind of like text, what kind of metadata would it need? Um, because it really is part of a habit. When I worked at NASA, 
um, whenever you deploy something for the government, mm -hmm. it has to pass a 508 check. And if you do not pass 508, it doesn't get deployed, period. And we kept getting held up by the 508 group, and we thought they hated us because mm. they kept, like, you know, holding up our stuff. Well, we finally one day during a lull sat down and read everything we could get our hands on about 508 compliance and how to make accessible websites. And you know, it didn't take us that long, but being able to think that way and being able to refine, like having a good framework in our mind, mm -hmm. going forward, we got past 508 every time. You know, any issues we had were super minor, and we knew how to fix them immediately. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the things that it's like if you sit down and educate people and have it be a habit, which it became a habit with us, that walking into it, we would no more write an inaccessible website than we would write one without proper tests or without, you know, a way to back up, you know, the mm -hmm. site or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, it just became a big habit, habit for us. And fortunately, we had management that supported this because they saw how much cheaper it was and we were suddenly the team that everything was on time and under budget. Mm -hmm. Dennis, I mean, it sounds like you guys at Canon have really built this into your culture. Uh, when, when you when you mentioned uh, sort of the way that you sort of think about things in harmony, what what advice would you give to others? I mean, first of all, do you agree with what uh, with, with what Katie just had to say there? And how have you guys incorporated this as a habit? And, and what advice would you give to others? Yeah, I mean, certainly, um, certainly that's not easy. In fact, um, you know, when we think about challenges, uh, you know, I think one of the challenges that many organizations, particularly companies like ours, face is, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, developing technology uh, in, in support of uh, the, the PWD community uh, in, in a way that, that, you know, is also conducive to providing enhanced functionality for, you know, ge general users in, in the population. It isn't always less expensive in, in terms of development cost and manufacturing and so forth. So, um, you know, trying to get organizations to, to get past some of those issues and recognize that there are significant benefits, not, not only the altruistic benefits, uh, but, but also financial benefits to, to designing in that way, um, certainly is not, not, you know, is not something that's easily overcome. And, and you know, again, in, in Canon's case, um, you know, the, the nature of, of our philosophy is really one that, that has been, just been so conducive to this area that um, it, it's such a tight connection to our culture overall that, that, that maybe the, the challenge for us in, in, in reaching the point we have, you know, wasn't, um, you know, su such a high mountain to climb as, as it might be for other organizations. But, um, you know, without question, uh, it, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. Um, the other point I would make here is that um, when we look at challenges in the marketplace uh, in general, I, I think we'll find that, um, well, yes, some organizations certainly pay a significant amount of attention to, uh, to this area and um, you know, are, are very focused around this as a key criteria in terms of sourcing technology. Uh, I, I wouldn't say enough of them are, quite frankly, uh, and this is true even for government agencies that we sell into. So, so although you know, Katie kind of referenced NASA, mm -hmm. um, you know, the reality is, you know, Canon sells to virtually every government agency, uh, you know, that that there is uh, within mm -hmm. the federal space. And I, I can tell you from firsthand experience that uh, some agencies place a very high importance on on accessible technology. Uh, and for others, it, it's not even a factor in their decision-making process. So there, there are still significant, um, you know, challenges I think that have to be overcome in, in both the, uh, the the government as well as the commercial marketplaces in, in this area. And, and again, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, through further education, uh, you know, we can see those challenges, uh, you know, ultimately uh, be, become overcome as well. So that's a great segue into the first uh, question we have from the audience here. One of our participants has asked. How do you think the federal government should encourage vendors, especially small businesses and startups, who aren't so knowledgeable about accessibility to produce accessible products for government? Uh, according to this, uh, this individual, having explicit language in contracts isn't working. We need to do something new. Um, who wants to jump on that grenade? Dennis, do you want to take a first shot at that one? Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> jumping on that grenade maybe is the uh, is the appropriate uh, you know um, frame of reference here for for this. I mean, this is not an easy it's not an easy question. I mean, um, smaller enterprises in general are obviously 
you know, have, have even larger challenges by comparison to a company like Canon, for example, that, that uh, in our case, uh, you know, of course, we, we have a really significant R&D budget. Um, and, you know, in some ways, uh, you know, if, if we make an R&D bet, we, 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 can, we can, you know, afford to, uh, uh, to be wrong on occasion and still survive, whereas in, in, in some cases with smaller organizations, um, they, they don't have that luxury, quite frankly. So, um, you know, if they're going to build technology like that, it, it, it needs to be incumbent upon uh, the, the end customer that that, uh, that is going to be an absolute mandatory criteria for, for sourcing. And so I, I don't know that this question has, has an easy answer, frankly, because I, I think on the one hand, yes, um, you know, government could certainly legislate uh, this and, and, and create uh, laws that require this kind of development. Frankly, I'm not a big a big advocate of more government regulation. I think, frankly, we have enough as it is. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, I'd, I'd much rather see the government take take action to require that as part of their sourcing initiatives. Um, they, they give stronger consideration uh, to um, technology that supports. Uh, uh, you know, accessible design, uh, and and use that uh, as a key criteria in terms of sourcing. Uh, you know, and, and in doing so, I think they would then drive the behaviors that that maybe they they want to see in terms of small business uh, and, and the technologies that they provide. Mm -hmm. um, I want to also pull Jim Tobias back into this conversation. Uh, Jim, if you're still with us, uh, how would you respond to this question? You've got a lot of experience in this area. Well, um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, uh, Dennis's comment just now, you know, that, that's, the, that's the motivation of Section 508. So it's, you know, to leverage um, the, the federal uh, purchasing dollar and, and to some extent the larger public sector uh, purchasing dollar uh, to favor accessible uh, products. Uh, I, I think um, you know, this is this is always going to be an issue of, is it you know we need new laws, new regulation, more oversight, more you know transparency, more clarity. Uh, you can always you know sit in the bar and have a great discussion about that for hours on end. Um, but it is the motivation, and and you can certainly see uh, instances where it succeeded. Um, I personally feel that. We have more problems on the demand side right now than we do on the supply side, and this is not to curry favor with any of the wonderful folks on the panel, um, but the ICT industry has really stepped up and provided, um, you know, just yards and yards of additional accessibility over, you know, year over year, um, and they continue to do so. Uh, you know, and maybe there's some, a some, uh, little bit of slack in communicating about that and providing good documentation about accessibility. But what I mean on the demand side is that we're not seeing sufficient um, market demand from individual consumers or um, public sector or employers uh, to, you know, to kind of um, redeem the promise of accessibility uh, that's being delivered on the supply side. So that's again one of the goals of Pete is to help companies uh, on both sides of that negotiating table come together and understand their different roles and communicate openly, clearly, um, and continuously about accessibility. And that will, I think, generate the market momentum that we'll see. And that may result in the need, you know, less of a need for regulation, government oversight, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, Laurie or Katie, do either of you want to jump in on this one? or? I think another thing um, I would love to see is better education because talking to people who have, for instance, degrees in computer science or degrees in front-end design or stuff like that, um, if I ask them, what, was there an accessibility course at your college? And they're like, no, but I learned assembly. And I'm like, well, of the two things, guess which one is actually useful? Um, that most of us are going to use. Most of us are going to need to think about accessibility at some point smaller percentage needs to worry about assembly. Um, so I'd love to see more pushes to get this, you know, more colleges to accept this as one of the things that you just have to teach in these programs. I'd also like to see, there's lots of um, good resources in the government if you go through, like, you know, how do I get my, my five-way questions answered, where do I get training? 
but they're not always presented in the best way. Um, I've had to dig through the websites to find really excellent resources with like examples and this and that, but they're not, you know, pushed up to the top where they need to be. Um, they're not, you know, pushed out. They're not shown to people. They're not. Um, I'm looking for a word here in blanking because you know, speaking live. But you know what I mean. Sure. It's they need to advocate for these things more clearly because the materials are there. There's mm -hmm. lots of materials. There's lots of great websites, but nobody knows where they are. Um, so it's really hard for people to go out and find them to even educate themselves. Mm -hmm. So speaking of education, that actually brings up uh, another question from our audience, uh, and that has to do with the difference or similarity between accessible versus assistive uh, technologies. Are these the same thing, or how are they different? Um, Katie, would you, was that something you'd, you'd want to address? I'm trying to think of an answer. It's a new question for me. Um, Assistive technologies, when you make something that is accessible, you are exposing everything. Mm -hmm. um, I think assistive would be, you would be talking about how somebody gets to that information. So a screen reader is an assistive technology because it's made for a specific person, somebody who is blind and needs some, uh, something to read out what's on the screen or put it in a braille reader versus me having an accessible, web, an accessible website which works for many people because I'm exposing it for many different user groups. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That makes sense to me. Uh, other panelists, um, anybody want to offer a different, uh, Jim, do you want to maybe chime in here? I can, I can or, chime in on that. Go ahead. Yeah, please. Oh, sure, sure. This is Lori. Um, so we tend to think of accessible technology as di being accessible directly. Um, it's usable without assistive technology or it's compatible with assistive technology. Um, accessible technology can be used by people with a, a wide range of abilities or disabilities and it sort of incorporates the principles of universal design, whereas with assistive technology I tend to think of that as a, more of an umbrella term uh, that includes adaptive technology and promotes greater independence by people who might have certain limitations. Um, th this is Jim. Can I? That's true. That's a great uh, definition. Go ahead. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I love what, ahead, the, what Katie and, and Lori had to say. I think they're they're very accurate, and this is a, a topic with a lot of um, facets to it. But um, and we're we're also seeing a, a lot of change in in these um, uh, you know in the technologies themselves as accessibility features migrate and you know mutate um, uh, from assistive technology products into mainstream products and, and back and forth. So I think a way of resolving this is really um, adding clarity by, by going a little deeper and not trying to categorize the product, but try to categorize the feature. So an accessibility feature like uh, enlarged text or volume control or, you know, simpler, uh, uh, simple text um, could be part of an assistive technology product sold especially for the use of people with disabilities, or it could be a feature built into a mainstream device, uh, you know, an accessibility feature living in a piece of mainstream technology. And it actually gets easier to understand what you need to do or what the product needs next is not some um, you know, a black box uh, term like more accessibility, it needs a particular feature uh, or a set of features. And it's, I think it's easier for designers and developers to think of it that way. And it's easier for consumers to search as that excellent um, GARI database on uh, Access Wireless shows. It's a really great way for uh, consumers to shop for products according to the features that they know they need. And I think that's the way that we're moving because technology is just, you know, migrating these features all over the place very quickly. So picking up on that um, idea of taking things from, uh, from the mass market or from, from, from the PWD market to the mass market and back and forth, another question from our audience is, uh, do, do companies ever look at accessibility as innovation for the mass market? For instance, people who are deaf or hard of hearing have been texting for many decades, but now that the mass market texts, it's, uh, it's, it's innovative. Uh, so I, I wonder, um, maybe I'll start with Dennis. Uh, have you at Canon looked at, at how you can use 
uh, products or, develop, or things that you've developed for the uh, PWD market um, as an innovation opportunity for the mass market? Sure. Um, in fact, uh, let, let me give you a prime example of that. So we, we have a, um, a technology that uh, ultimately, uh, when it was developed, uh, was initially developed uh, to provide um, disabled users with the ability to remotely access the control panel of our, our, our MFPs. Uh, we call this a remote um, operator's kit. And, um, you know, again, um, what, what we found in, in terms of developing this technology initially is that uh, given the height of many of the devices that you find in the general office, um, an individual who might be wheelchair bound uh, would have a, an awfully difficult time in actually seeing and operating uh, the, the LCD panel on the, the MFP device. So we built this um, uh, remote operators kit so we could in essence replicate the user interface uh, on a, a locally uh, network connected PC. Well, what, what turned out is that, yes, the, the, the product itself or the technology itself certainly had great viability for, um, you know, folks with, uh, with, with that particular disability, but um, the, the technology itself proved to be in some ways even more useful as a remote training tool uh, for end users who, who needed to learn how to navigate through uh, the, the, the device to program the device to perform different types of, of copy and fax and scan and print features. So, um, so that I think that, that's a great example of how uh, you know, a technology that, that Canon had originally developed in support of the PWD community, um, you know, we ultimately found that, that it had e even you know, arguably a better use case uh, in, in connection with, with supporting the, the marketplace uh, in, in general. And, and I think we have a number of examples of that. And, and uh, again, um, you know, the, one of the points I made in, in presenting earlier, you know, when we're building technology, we're trying to build our technology so that the user experience is an ideal experience, regardless of whether the user happens to be able-bodied or, or, or possesses some form of disability. So we, we find many times that uh, a technology that we build uh, with the intent of, of uh, you know, solving a, a usability challenge for the PWD user Mm -hmm. um, you know, turns out to be uh, an effective technology, um, you know, for the, the, the population of users in general. That's great, Dennis. Uh, Laurie, are there some examples maybe from your membership that you might want to highlight? Um, I, I really don't have any examples of PWD products moving um, to, the mass, to the mass market, but I would just want to point out mm -hmm. that, um, you know, Innovation and customization are really key issues that drive mobile accessibility, including specific technology. Um, well, yeah, it's their drivers of mobile accessibility. And so, what in the area of innovation, um, accessibility is really a key component of the design and implementation of new products and services. And really, thanks to innovation, people with disabilities have been able to um, create their own unique devices um, and their own unique experiences by customizing wireless services and devices through built-in features that I had mentioned um, in my presentation and apps to meet their needs. So, you know, with what we're seeing is with, you know, more people and more households uh, moving into a wireless-only environment, uh, we know that people with disabilities who are increasingly turning to wireless as their primary method of communication, and we know that they're using a lot of products that are already out there on the mass market. So that's sort of like an a answer in reverse. So they are, people with disabilities are taking products in the mass market and applying it as they see fit, and that, um, you know, that's something that we are, that we're noticing. Yeah, it also seems to me that, you know, with effective BYOD policies, one of the things we're seeing in the mass market is that consumer electronics are driving innovation in the workplace because people are bringing you know, these really cool devices into the workplace and expecting them to function in the mm -hmm. workplace. And um, it sounds like you're saying the same, the same holds true for, for people with disabilities. And, and, and with good BYOD policies, we can kind of create the infrastructure that would allow that to happen more, uh, more frequently. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the next question I want to turn to is get a little bit more specific here. Uh, one of the folks uh, in the audience here is asking, what are some of the things the accessibility experts would like to recommend we use or integrate into our websites? Uh, and maybe, uh, Katie, I'll go back to you. Are, are there specific things that you would recommend that uh, some of our, our listeners use or adopt? 
or integrate? Um, I would definitely have everyone learn what um, alt text is, because it's one of those things that's still not very, it's not understood very well. Uh, have them understand what alt text is. I would have them caption their videos. These are two huge blind spots that people tend to just kind of ignore or pretend that there's an automated solution to them, and there really isn't. Um, so those are two things I would love to see more of. Um, and just have people practice like getting on a website just by hitting tab to see where like their tab order goes. Mm -hmm. There'll be like a little outline around the item. And just make sure you can get mm -hmm. to everything, that all the drop downs work. If you want to go the easy route, um, things like Bootstrap are often very accessible. There's also um, Superfish and Suckerfish, and those are libraries that have a lot of really great interactive UI elements mm -hmm. um, that are all accessible. They're made for accessibility, and they're really easy to customize, and they're really easy to make work with your site. Um, those are some things I would love to see more people using. Mm -hmm. um, Jim, any, any uh, specific recommendations you'd throw out there? Well, there, there's a lot of guidance out there, um, and, and a lot of it's very good guidance. And as, as Katie said, you know, the problem is not the scarcity of guidance, of good guidance. It's that it's hard to find because there's so much out there. Um, but you know, with respect to web accessibility, we have a huge community of practitioners with very solid um, technological uh, leadership on accessibility over the years that has resulted in um, uh, the document that people call WCAG, or Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, um, which you can Google, and, and maybe we can put um, the, the URL uh, in the chat window for people who aren't familiar with it. But it provides a really solid uh, uh, way to approach web accessibility because it tells you what you need to accomplish. It doesn't tell you how, but it does give you some techniques that would be sufficient. And so whether you're just getting started with accessibility or whether you're looking for finely detailed um, you know, uh, uh, guidance information, that's a great place uh, to, to begin your search. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Uh, Lori, I got a specific question for you um, about uh, what's going on there at CTIA. Uh, one of our folks wants to know, uh, do we have numbers on the uh, number of number of persons with disabilities who uh, are users of cell phones and other uh, wireless technologies? Um, well, CTIA does not um, collect or track that information as an organization. We rely very heavily on an organization um, over at uh, Georgia Tech or the Georgia Institute of Technology, and the name of the group is um, Wireless RERC. And they have really good numbers that we've used in the past. Um, they, they do pretty regular surveys of people with disabilities, and I think that's mm -hmm. one of the metrics that they track. Uh, so and I, um, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that uh, the person who asked the question, I'm, I'm happy to put them in, in contact with someone at the Wireless RERC if they're looking for updated numbers. That's wonderful. Maybe we can uh, get that information from you as well and provide that in our... Uh, in our follow-up materials as well. So thank you for that. Um, now the next question coming in from the audience is, how is the private sector going to train its many employees to design accessible documents in conformance to WCAG? Uh, who would like to take that one on? Jim? Talk can... about that a bit. Oh, great. Um, with documents, there's often accessibility features built into things like Adobe and PowerPoint and such. And I would recommend sitting down and getting very familiar with them. First of all, if you make PDFs, make sure the text is exposed. Um, do not like try to do just the scan where it's just like a picture of the text. Some people do that for security reasons. Some do it because it's an actual scan of a document. Make sure that that text is somehow accessible to everybody. Um, not only do you need that, but if there's any images in it, you need to have those images captioned. Of particular interest, especially in documents and PowerPoints and things like that, are graphs. Understand how to caption graphs. Um, with graphs, you have to describe what the data is doing without implying anything. 
um, because the idea is, is that a person who is sighted would look at a graph and be able to come, like they would say, oh, okay, sales rose in you know, November, dropped off in January, and then went up again in May. So you need to describe it in that way, like you're describing it over a phone. You wouldn't list out a number of data points. Um, that's the correct way. And the reason I bring this up and I beat this point, often when people are doing things like um, making compliant PDFs or PowerPoints, there's almost always a graph in there somewhere, especially if it's like a, for a business or government or something like that. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Jim or uh, Katie or, or Dennis, anybody else want to jump in on that one? Um, yeah, this is this is Jim. I'll 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 kind of second um, what was just said on the on the technical issues that arise, um, but looking at it, you know, organizationally, this really has to do with uh, within the enterprise. You know, what it, what is the what are the resources for staff training, and to what extent are those tools built in so that the default is to create accessible content and and you know so for an example um, there's a way of uh, in Microsoft Word of uh, when someone pastes an image into a document to prompt them for alt text so having a tool like that that prompts the the author you know could be just anyone a writer you know somebody writing a, a, a report um, but if you get that prompt you don't really need to do any additional training. See, so it's you're saving an hour of training about how to add alt to every image by creating a just-in-time tool that does the prompting for you. Um, so those techniques are really an organizational decision. You know, the, whoever manages IT says, okay, we're going to set that insert command within Microsoft Word to pop up this alt text requester. And Imagine that, you know, hundreds of times for all of the different authoring tools, and we'll be well on our way to reducing the training demands, which we know in, in a typical enterprise, you just don't have time to provide training for all your staff on all of the topics that you want them to be expert in. So it's a puzzle that we still have to work on, but again, it's more a question of getting the architecture of the enterprise right than it is you know, insisting that anyone who dares to write an email has to go through a four-day accessibility training program. Just not feasible to do that. Awesome. Um, this is Lori. Yeah. I can add to that as well. I just wanted to um, point out for, you know, our member companies uh, see accessibility as a corporate value, and so therefore it is embedded into the, um, in the philosophy and the infrastructure within the companies. And so, uh, for example, AT&T, which is one of our larger member companies, I know that they have the um, the Corporate Accessibility Technology Office, which is um, what they use to promote accessibility in AT&T's products and services. Um, I know that Sprint has a very similar um, office within uh, within their company, and I know that these, um, you know, they have people that are working on these issues every day, and I know that it's incorporated in um, again, in in their structure as a company. So I just wanted to point that out. Mm -hmm. And that was actually one of the um, questions I wanted to get to. Was it was about the role of um, offices like that or other uh, you know, accessibility champions? Is that is that uh, um, a position that that we're seeing a lot of? Uh, Jim or Katie, do you want me to take that one first? You guys are talking. You're on mute. Oh. Uh, sorry. Could you repeat it real fast? The question was about um, about the um, use of accessibility champions within organizations. Is that um, a? Yeah, it does, I'm the use. I'm generally the accessibility uh, champion. Um, it does help having somebody because it's not my full time job. I'm not a full time accessibility person. I'm a developer. But it helps because not only am I the champion, I'm the person they can come to and ask the questions. That they come up with these just one-off questions like, hey, um, my, the customer wants to use red and green. Um, we, can we do that or can we not do that? I heard that was bad. And I'm like, oh, no, let's sit down. Let's look at good greens, good, great, good combinations, bad combinations. Um, I can give really quick answers 
two questions, and that helps to have somebody like that on your staff or that you know. Um, I also have people that I'm friends with in the open source mm -hmm. community that I will track me down on Twitter and say, hey, what do you think of X versus, you know, X versus Y? And I will mm -hmm. say, ah, X is the better solution. Because often I can make those calls really quickly. Uh, it does not take me a long time to look over something. So having somebody in your back pocket that you can trust to go to the, go talk to them about these kind of things saves you quite a bit of time. Um, so I don't have to spend a lot of time running around and yelling at people and saying, no, you have to be accessible. It's often people coming to me and saying, help me make this accessible and showing me the problem. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I like, th th thanks very much, uh, Katie, for that. Um, I'd like to bring up one more polling question while we've got a couple minutes here, uh, which actually is this very issue of whether or not uh, folks in the audience have accessibility champions in their organization. Um, and if, once we bring that polling question up, if you could answer yes or no to that. Uh, uh, to that. And while we're waiting for answers, uh, Jim, are you seeing um, you know, the use of, 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 uh, of accessibility champions as a, as a tool? Yeah, we, we've heard a number of times from organizations um, who are kind of all over the map in how well developed their accessibility program is that having a champion or executive sponsor is a, is a key point, and, and it is for, for several reasons. One is that requesting one often forces you to get your act together. You know, you're, you're going to have a meeting with a vice president. Um, you better have more than just a, a hand-waving exercise in what your accessibility program is going to be all about, and how is it going to be efficient and effective, and how is it going to be measured, and all of those things that drive improvements at the organizational level. And then, of course, the, the second and strategically more valuable point sometimes is you've got someone, you know, watching your back. You've got someone that you can say, you know, uh, when you're talking to a product manager who's having a hard time understanding why, uh, you know, they, they may have to um, uh, perform some accessibility testing that might delay a product release, very tough, you know, conversation to have. Uh, you've got somebody's name to drop, and maybe more than just a name, you've got a way to, you know, being at the table when those kinds of strategic decisions are made. So it is very valuable, both as a kind of a flag and as a, a, a token in uh, institutional politics. That's terrific. Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, looks, oh, look at that. 75% of folks on the line have uh, an accessibility champion. That's, uh, that's wonderful, and as we've just heard, that's also a great, uh, a great resource. I have time for one last question uh, from our audience. We want to know, how do the panelists see the new 503 regulations uh, affecting accessibility initiatives? And um, maybe we can go back in, in sort of reverse order here from our original panelists. So, Lori, do you want to jump on that one? Um, I really have to think about that. So if you could come back to me, that would be great. I can, I can do that, absolutely. I know Dennis had to, to step out, but I believe uh, uh, Paul Albano has stepped in, stepped in from Canon. Uh, Paul, do you have thoughts? How does Section 503 affect, um, what was that? Was it product design or um, 508? Ac accessibility initiatives was the question. How does Section 503 affect accessibility initiatives? Well, I mean, I, I guess you know, speaking um, speaking for Canon and speaking about the products which uh, which Dennis mentioned, um, you know, to the extent that our office type uh, devices are, you know, critical components within a uh, workplace setting, and uh, as companies are, you know, now need to start, you know, thinking about um, having programs to uh, include more, you know, people with disabilities in the workforce. Um, th th those products are going to be um, essential. So you're going to have uh -huh. to start building the infrastructure to support, you know, these additional employees in the workplace. So I think I think it will certainly help drive more um, innovation and in, in accessible design uh, from a manufacturing standpoint, for sure. Great, uh, Jim. Last word here. Um, well, 503, um, you know, it, it's new, so we're not entirely sure how it's going to play out. But what it does require is that the application process be accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and while it doesn't go into much detail about what that actually means and 
that's you know an area where technical clarity is always a good thing. The net effect, I think, is going to be for um, on the on the side of technology providers like our folks on the call today, making sure that the products that you offer um, for job application platforms, and that can be you know a, that's a whole string of products right there from websites to resume uploaders to you know interview scheduling calendars and all of that. Um, that there will be some more accessibility attention on there because nobody wants to jeopardize their um, federal contract. And that, it, that really applies even more so over on the employer side, making sure that when they post a job or when they do anything connected with um, uh, job applications, that whole process, that that be as accessible as possible. So it's, uh, you know, a, a little murky. But, you know, if you were to see a storm front coming, that's not the time to throw your umbrella away. That's the time to, you know, figure out what it is you need to do to stay safe. So that's the mode that I think we're in. And Pete is going to have some sizable resources uh, to help um, Pete networkers in addressing their 503 requirements as providers and as employers. Well, thank you, Jim, uh, and thanks to all of our panelists. Unbelievably, our hour and a half has just flown by here, and we've reached that time when we're going to have to wrap up our webinar. This has been just a wonderful discussion. For you developers out there, I hope you've heard a lot uh, on this uh, discussion, and I hope you can take some of the things away from this and start building accessibility into your product development uh, right away. And today we had time to cover just a small part of this whole topic, so please stick with Pete and we'll be helping you along the way. For those of you who'd like to view this webinar again or tell your colleagues and friends about it, an archive version of this webcast will be available on peteworks.org in the very near future. Going forward, Pete is also going to have lots of great information and resources to help employers, developers, and users. You can follow Pete on Facebook and Twitter for updates, so please stay tuned to Pete for information about more webinars coming up and the big launch in October. Thanks so much to our incredible panel, Jim, Dennis, Katie, Lori, and Paul, you've been amazing, and we appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge with our network. And finally, thanks to you, everyone out there, for participating, for sending in your great questions, and we hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, I've been Richard Crispine. Thank you so much for joining us.